We're going to be discussing book 19 of the uh, City of God. It is in many ways the high point of the book, though the, the following, uh, the concluding books are extremely interesting. Um, but this is the one that political philosophers love to focus on. In fact, it's the, the, um, the book of uh, the City of God most commented on by, by a long stretch. So there's a lot to talk about. I want to give some uh, orientation in terms of the, uh, the perpetual, uh, the perennial question of nature and grace that theologians like to talk about. Because here we have a great test case. Um, how do the different, uh, how do the two cities relate to each other in terms of uh, uh, temporal peace? How do we stand if we have citizenship in the kingdom of God? How does one make use of the uh, temporal goods that an empire, say, might be able to acquire? And that opens up the question of how stable the ends per pursued by uh, secular humanity are. Uh, ends here, teloi, telos, is um, not the, uh, the cessation of something. It is the thing that a process leads to. It is the culmination. It is the, um, the final state of a thing. And so we get that fancy word teleology from that. And Augustine shows himself truly the heir to both the, the heritage of Jerusalem and of Athens in that he fully takes on yet again the philosophical inheritance and he reproduces it. We, we get that long discussion about Vero's typology of the pursuit of happiness. And we see that in fact, Augustine, as we've seen before, has an immense amount of um, overlap with the classical philosophical tradition. But then he's always contextualizing it and qualifying it in terms of the revelation of God in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So Augustine is affirming the philosophical assumption, presupposition, that the end of human life is happiness. Uh, we have that classically expressed, you know, in book one of the Nicomachean Ethics of Aristotle, that for the sake of which, which is um, a term that Augustine reproduces in the first uh, chapter of book 19. The, the final end of the human is happiness. Okay, what does that mean? It is the good. It is the good for the sake of which we pursue all other goods. And Augustine adds that there is also a supreme evil uh, to avoid which we avoid other evils. Okay, so that's, that's why we're here in the last four books of the City of God talking about the ends, the, the final state of the two cities. And he begins that final discussion with this consideration of ends as such, the supreme good and the supreme evil. Uh, book 20 will go on to talk about judgment at which the two cities are separated definitively. And then um, 21 will talk about the, the end of the earthly city being hell and then the final book being the end of the um, city of God being eternal bliss. Okay, so it's it's all very clear. The, uh, the, the structure of, of the work has always been fairly uh, pellucid. What Augustine does in this book is re-describe the supreme good in terms of peace, pox. And uh, that's, that's where we're going to get into these um, very, uh, I think, subtle uh, considerations of the the goods and the difficulties of social life. He, he has the longest litany of uh, lament about temporal existence he, uh, in this book. He talks about how friendship um, can go bad, that friends betray uh, other friends. And, and he goes on to talk about if that happens um, between uh, friends and if it happens in households, uh, how much more is it gonna happen in um, the city? And he, he just he extends the, the analysis um, of woe to include um, 
the, the most cosmic scale, saying that we we have no sure um, happiness here on Earth. So he's going to criticize again. We've seen it before. He's going to criticize the philosophers for two mistakes. One, uh, which is a little odd given book 10, but he's going to say that uh, the philosophers tend to assume that happiness can be had here on Earth. We already know that Platonists generally don't hold that, but he's going to have that as one of the certainly certain philosophers like the Stoics did hold that there could be happiness here. And he's going to ridicule that, especially the Stoics treating immense, um, devastating um, losses as if they aren't losses at all. And then he's going to criticize Platonists for saying that, yes, they are losses, but you can still be happy um, suffering them. And he's going to have, I think, a very human reaction to betrayal and uh, madness and the things that can happen to our bodies and minds here in time. And he's going to say these are these are horrible things and they make happiness impossible here on Earth. So he agrees with the philosophical tradition that happiness is the goal. He disagrees that it can be had here on Earth. And the second thing he disagrees with the philosophers on is that we can do it on our own. That's something that's going to reflect his his um, battle with the Pelagians, who who uh, were theological opponents within the Christian Church about uh, whether we can do meritorious, uh, salvific deeds without grace. And he, I think he sees in the philosophers the same kind of pride, superbia, um, that we can somehow attain to the ultimate without uh, divine aid. And so those are the two mistakes he believes that. So Athens, if we were to use that as a symbolizing of the uh, classical philosophical tradition, he thinks that this is a, a huge blind spot and that you need the whole uh, differentiation, as it were, of, of, of heart and mind that occurs in Israel and in Christianity, um, revelation, uh, something that comes from above and could only come from above both knowledge of things that we could not know and also uh, actual help to get us to do things that we couldn't do on our own, good things. Um, because in fact, as we know from that other work, De Corruzione, that uh, he believes that after the fall, humans can only fail. Uh, we can't do anything else but sin. So um, this, this notion of uh, peace is going to be the uh, new note that he sounds as an ordering principle in this book. And it's very, I think, analytically fruitful. Uh, one thing to note is that in this discussion about nature and grace, he links peace with the very uh, order of natures and nature as a whole. That is, um, when he has that bizarre example, I mean, it's like, straight out of um, uh, Sakovindu's um, silence, right? This, this guy hanging upside down and, and trying to say, uh, where can you find peace in that? Well, he's talking about how each of the parts still work according to nature. And so for, for Augustine, the order of reality in terms of nature's um, and how they're arranged together, order is for him the proper disposition of equal and unequal things, okay? so. Nature, each thing has a nature. These natures are all arranged um, intelligibly, wisely by God. And internally and relationally, that order is um, peace. It's the right order. Okay, so um, peace requires that we be, ultimately means that we be uh, God directed. And so that means that if you're outside of the, and one doesn't know exactly how um, conscious he wants us to be, but it, it seems to be pretty conscious for Augustine, that if you don't direct your virtue even to God and say, I owe it to God and I am directing um, intentionally my, my actions to God, then it's going to be out of order. And so there's going to be a even in the pursuit of virtue, there will be a, a breakdown of uh, peace and there will be war. So, um, so that's, that's what, uh, every time we, we see how the tranquility of order, which is his definition of peace, that this, this, 
the serenity of how God wants things to be but broken at the fall, right? The, the great break being my soul isn't submitted. I'm not obeying God. So that God directedness is, is righteousness in biblical terms. So I get, at the fall, we lose that. Everything else falls apart. Body no longer obeys soul. Um, the rational part of the um, soul doesn't control the irrational parts. And those irrational parts seem to be um, Augustine's way of defining vice. Uh, again, there are there are very real differences here between the scholastic later scholastic tradition and uh, Augustine's notions of virtue and vice. Vice here is something that coexists with virtue, which is not um, the full blown Thomistic view, um, which is that if you develop in virtue, then all, uh, that reduces more and more as virtue increases, um, the possibility of vice decreases. That's not Augustine's view. Um, somehow nature outside of this God directedness is it's precisely secularized nature as it were that's um, it has its own intelligibility he's affirming philosophical tradition in that it makes sense you can understand it but you take away the God directedness of it you close it off nature then becomes something that's vicious it, even though it's good it's still it's a thing that throw it's its impulses are now um, not working in the right way, not because it's bad, but because the human person is out of order. And therefore these these impulses are necessarily going to be um, disintegrating. That's a hypothesis anyway. I mean, I'm still trying to work through this, but that, that seems to me that war is something that's just going to happen when you cut off the God directedness and um, it, war at every level, inside oneself, between um, friends and uh, in society as a whole. And at the beginning of the work, uh, he goes through Barrow's uh, typology of um, possible uh, positions on how to find happiness. And the, the big terms to realize here are prima naturi, the primary things of nature like health or sanity or uh, good sensibility or rationality, the things that come before virtue, virtue being a thing that's taught, a thing that's second, uh, not something that's given with nature. And for uh, the classical philosophical tradition, generally, the consensus would be, and Augustine follows this, one should pursue the primary goods of nature only for the sake of virtue. Uh, we shouldn't do the, the Humean thing of inverting the two where we use virtue, that is um, the shaping of the soul's power to pursue um, things like health and pleasure and rest. Mm -hmm.